expert? What type of coffee maker? Well, it's a <laughs> not not really a too fancy one, uh, but I like it. <laughs> okay. Wait, this is the uh, question, question answers. Oh, okay. it's the Q and A, the first very first Q and A. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so it's a pleasure to have shown. Uh, Introducing us to all the wonders of what control theory can do together with RL. Uh, so, Sean, stage is yours. Okay. All right. Well, I've been looking forward to this for a while. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm Sean Mine at the University of Florida. And um, this is um, about 45 minutes from my house. It's Vanity Springs. And, um, that, and that's a little manatee that you'll find. Uh, swimming around in the springs in the winter time to stay warm, and you can see here that France doesn't have any manatees, so I had to substitute something. Um, so when uh, when this this topic came up of giving this this, this little short course, you know, I was, I was obviously very excited and eager, and also I had seen uh, Richard Murray from Caltech give a crash course in control at the 2018 um real-time decision making program at art at, uh, at at Berkeley and we need our t-shirts the logo is so cool we need t-shirts um and he did such a beautiful job of sort of of explaining the field of control it was really an inspiration and so that's why I asked you all to please sit, uh, watch his uh, video in advance so I'm sort of motivated in part by his his tutorial and then I'm going to give some history of the subject and and may, maybe ideas that can help uh, RL and also sort of a roadmap of the, of the lectures to go. Okay, uh, lots of people to thank. Uh, in particular, um, Vivek Borkar wearing a mask before it was cool. Um, uh, I started uh, because of Ben Van Roy's thesis and and my first sabbatical with Vivek. I uh, got into reinforcement learning. So that was back in the late 90s. Um, and then Aditya Devraj, who just graduated and is now a postdoc at Berkeley, he dragged me kicking and screaming back into the area three years ago. And he got his PhD in the area. And Anna Bushic has been a, a longtime collaborator and inspiration. Um, and the same goes for Prashant Mehta and Eric Moline. And there's too many people to list. I mean, my advisor, was such an incredible Peter Kane's uh, insp inspiration as a grad student, and forget I won't go through all these things, uh, people. But some of these people in this list are people inspired me because of their work, and other people because of, um, uh, of collaborations. And um, yeah, okay. So um, here's a quick uh, outline. I won't go through it. Um, just I will I will mention this. Okay. So again, I said this a thousand times in Discord. Uh, it's really valuable to look at this uh, overview of Richard Murray. He gives a nice overview of sort of control uh, philosophy. Um, then there's two. There's a tutorial I gave at um, at Berkeley two years ago, and it takes it sort of you know discusses my view of the stochastic side of things, um, and 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 really starts off with the premise of Eric yesterday that asymptotic theory shouldn't be ignored. It's really, really valuable for insight. And sometimes it's surprising how it works. And I feel like that's, that's when it says hidden theory, that's all I meant was that asymptotic theory is super valuable and really crisp and clean and pretty. So if you want to know more, see that, I'll wait until my book comes out next year. <laughs> so COVID did one favor for me. It said, what the hell, I might as well do it. And I spent the whole summer Instead of having fun in France, I, I, I spent uh, my time writing these lecture notes for this uh, presentation, those five chapters. Okay. Um, and then, you know, um, there's other resources here. Okay, so some apologies to begin with. Pi is not 3.14, and it's not a policy because a pi is an invariant measure. I'm sorry, it just always will be for me. It will never be a policy. I can't do it. So I will use phi for feedback or I'll put a little tilde on top for a randomized policy. That's apology number one. 
Um, control engineers minimize cost. We never receive any rewards for it. It's just uh, one of the curses of the field. And so I have an input space instead of an action space, and I'm minimizing cost and not maximizing reward. This, it's a curse of being a control engineer. And finally, I'm not meaning to be rude or offensive or whatever. I will sometimes be critical and it's just an opinion. <laughs> and so please don't be offended. Uh, I don't have all the answers. So often when somebody's being critical of something, the perception is that they're arrogant and they know all the answers, saying they know all the answers. I don't have all the answers. There's some things that I think maybe are a mistake and it's just an opinion. And my opinion could be stupid. Let's investigate, okay? All right, so this won't be as provocative as I thought I might make it, because I do have some stark opinions, as some of you know, um, but I will, I will shake things a bit, all right? All right, so let's go through with some background. So this is, this is what you'll get if you go to Wikipedia and look up reinforcement learning. All right, and so my first, so this is, this is probably the most adversarial <laughs> um, part of my lectures of the entire day. Um, I won't read this out for you, you know, I mean, well, maybe I will. Reinforcement learning is an area of machine learning, yes, concerned with how software agents are to take actions in an environment to maximize some notion of cumulative reward. Not bad. But this thing, this thing, please, let's make it a task of this, of this semester to edit this chart, all right? I mean, why on earth? Is SARSA always in a discrete action, a state space? I mean, so let's fix Wikipedia, okay? That's that's a challenge for the boot for the for the semester. But by the um, way, yeah, yeah. I, this is some new addition to Wikipedia. I've never seen this uh, version of it. It's the standard page of Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. It, this is what it looked like in July. Oh yeah, I see it now. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really wacky, wow. you know. It changes wow. every year. You should have seen the Markov chain definition five years ago. Now it's the best. It's the wow. best definition. But five years ago, it was just laughable. Um, and so, you know, examples people talk about is stock trading. People have been selling reinforcement learning to Wall Street forever. And Wall Street actually is kind of pissed off at RL. I mean, for reasons that we could discuss. Autonomous cars, small buildings, smart cities. And, you know, what the hell are we talking about? <laughs> because I forgot, I, I mean, look what I highlighted. Everything is model free. So the, the claim is that if it's not, if it's not model free, it's not RL. <laughs> It's just, and and the thing is that trading stocks, driving cars, managing the grid, anyone who's actually tried to code RL knows how long it takes. By the time my algorithm has converged, there will be a whole new economy. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, there'll be a whole new political party in power. So, you know, we know about cra flash crashes and all of that. We know about the problems with autonomous cars. We're not gonna be learning as we drive, <laughs> you know. Um, and so we have to have a lot more humility. And I'm not, I'm not yelling at RL. Every field has this problem of overselling. And there's nobody who did, did a, who made a bigger mistake than the controls community. You know, they oversold their stuff in the 80s and they paid for it. <laughs> And neural networks too, right? There was a lot of overselling of neural networks back in the 70s. And they it, it really shut down the, the research area for a while just because of, of, of a, a very narrow definition of the subject. So let's just all agree that RL is a very, very young subject, you know, even though it's it's been around a long time. Um, and it's, it's evolving around with statistics and control and all of that. All right. Okay, so... How did control get it wrong? So the, the, there was incredible uh, excitement about adaptive control back in the 80s, and, in 70s and 80s. And this is, a, this is from a really nice, um, I should have put this in the bibliography, um, a tutorial by uh, Eric Yitze at CMU. 
And uh, and basically, it's, you know, some of the reports about this beautiful uh, uh, um, uh, airplane was that you don't need a model. <laughs> and it says here, it the pilot was unburdened, model free. You know, um, you know, the, the airplane was stable, any dynamic pressure, any angle of attack. I think it says somewhere that, yeah, the pilot could spend time cross-checking flight instructions, you know, making a cappuccino. <laughs> so, you know, so this is a sort of overselling of something very, very delicate. And here's what happened is that it didn't work. You know, it basically, there was high gain, there was parameter bursting, and it was not robust, you know, wind up means the parameters would grow because of integration. And wham, you know, killed a pilot. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it just went crazy and crashed. Um, and so this set back adaptive control decades. It just completely, of course it killed a pilot. You know, that's gone. You know, I, 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 I'm, so, I'm sad about that, but, but you know, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the fact that a lack of attention, a, a lack of humility killed a pilot and killed a field in a way. So adaptive control continued onwards, but only in very, very controlled uh, situations, you know, chemical engineering, paper manufacture, things like that. And I bet it could have done a lot more if people had been a bit more conservative, you know. And what happened is that robust control took over the control area in the 90s and 2000s, which was a very conservative field. They did beautiful science. People at Berkeley were some of the pioneers there. I was at McGill at the time where George Zanes was, who was absolutely astonishing hero, but incredibly conservative. So if you even talked about adaptive control, he'd leave the room. Um, so there's a conservatism in every field and sometimes people get overexcited and they make, mis they make big mistakes, you know? So let's keep this in mind. You know, we're gonna have to, I, I'm sure you need a model to somehow restrict the search space and, and get, um, to get stability guarantees of some sort, more intuition. There's gonna be some in applications like flight control, autonomous vehicles, medical applications. I suspect at least for the next 20 years, there'll be a hybrid between model-free and model-based approaches. All right, so those are fighting words to some people, <laughs> and it's my opinion. It's not, you know, I don't have all the answers. All right, so what control can offer? So this was me drunk in Zurich, walking home from a party at ETH and trying to find my way home. That's, uh, this is, uh, some of you might recognize this in Zurich, I don't know. Um, so this is basically stolen from uh, Richard Murray's tutorial. Um, and so, you know, this is just like right out of a reinforcement learning talk, you know, bike sharing, airplanes, the pancreas, you know, being an artificial pancreas, um, Wall Street. I've been, I was involved in semiconductor manufacturing, like scheduling problems. All these things are the process. Um, and we have inputs or actions, you know, which you all know about. Uh, this could be throttle or wheel position in the car. And then we have measurements and the measurements are noisy, you know. So the measurements could be the speed and position of the car and so forth. Okay, so that's lecture one in the control course for undergraduates, the senior level. Um, and this is a screenshot from Richard Murray's talk. Um, so basically when you talk about the specifications, there's a whole huge list, you know, there, there is, all sorts of transient things. There's something called a step response that people look at. It's just, it's just a convention of if I put in a step change to an input or a step change disturbance, how does it, the, the system respond? How long does it take to recover? Questions like that, these transient issues. Uh, these things you know, called rise time, how long does it take to recover? Overshoot, all these things. You know? um, and, and then basically the steady state responses to disturbance, and a lot of it is based on frequency response, which blows the mind of every young control student. Why would you look at the frequency response of an automobile if you wanted to learn how to control it? Can you imagine getting into a car and pushing the throttle down, letting go, push it down, a sine wave. All right, that's one frequency. 
Now do it really slowly, down for five minutes, up for five minutes, down for five minutes. Now do a megahertz <laughs> and see how the car responds. Now, you know, if you move the throttle fast, the car doesn't respond. You do it slowly, the car slows up, speeds down, slows up, speeds down. I mean, you know, I mean, yes, it speeds up, slows down. That is how you design a cruise control, is the frequency response. So that's why students go, what the hell? Why, what am I doing here? Because they think it, because it's such an abstraction. And yet it is 99% of control systems are, are designed based on frequency response. And these are just random plots from, from, um, from, from presentations. Um, you know, basically looking at response to disturbance or initial condition and frequency response of, you know, it doesn't matter what that is. But there are other things too, you know, there are hard constraints you can't violate and there's sort of, there's, you know, and both of the safety and liveness are things that come out of uh, just making sure that things are constrained and safe. All right. Now, the first thing you would do if you have a really good model is just invert. So there's something you care about, Z. It could be some big vector of things you care about. And there's some operator, say, um, G. So it doesn't have to be a linear system. G doesn't have to be a transfer function. There's some operator that takes inputs to things you care about, and you might not measure them, and you just invert, all right? And that's what's known as open loop control. And Richard Murray said, to my surprise, if you can do it, do it, <laughs> which is pretty bold statement. I don't know if people normally do that. Um, I think what he really meant is you come up with a sort of a regularized inverse, might be okay. You know, you don't really just invert. All right, the frequency domain is one way of defining that regularization. You don't try to invert at high frequencies, you just do it in, in moderate frequencies. All right. And classical control is all about that. All of classical control is this. You, you, there's a thing you care about Z, but you can't observe it, so you come up with an observer. And then you define, these are transfer functions, H and G, but just think of the operators if you don't know what that means. So it's something that you have an estimate of what you care about and you transform it in some sense. And again, and this is this depends on the entire history of your uh, of your um, measurements, of your estimates. Um, and you have another operator, the entire history of your observations, Y, and you choose it to get an approximate inverse. And it really is a regularization because you design this to basically invert in a certain frequency range and forget about the rest. That's classical control done. <laughs> and all of classical control, the first semester course, is about how to design the observer, how to design H, and how to design GC and justify it all. That's the entire, the entire course. Right. Yeah, uh, Sean, may I ask a question? Yep. <clears throat> so if you want to relate this to reinforcement learning, uh, how would you explain what's the relationship uh, between the control task that is yeah. being considered here versus the control task that reinforcement learning uh, traditionally would consider, you know, with reward functions or cost functions, if you wish. Yeah, so, so I'm, um, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do that in a moment. Okay, okay um, good. Yeah. Because I'm what sure it, that yeah. people are wondering about this. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, so basically, I can say this, that one justification is LQR. Can I do this? Yeah. So you basically minimize the sum k equals zero to infinity of c of x k, not z. Yeah, ZK. <clears throat> there. Yeah. Okay. So, so what I was thinking about that. Um, so the the control task that you were presenting uh, at the very high level yeah. is like. Really, this inverse view of point, like point of view that you want to design the inputs, maybe using feedback in such a way that something desired happens, but in all possible oh. ways. Like, 
the Z is like all possible behaviors and and you want it's a full inverse almost like what what is going on uh, oh. if we look at this diagram as an input output uh, diagram right so so that is Z that's the the task specification and then um, and then the U, that's that's what you design. If you could invert, you would invert. But uh, and in relation to reinforcement learning, uh, reinforcement oh. learning kind of like just reduces this to this one-dimensional reward signal thing. But here you're talking about, you know, like the full inverse of the system, if you wish. Right. Well, I guess I just yeah. realized it's on the next slide. Okay. It's right. It's right there. Where yeah. Did yeah. You get this? Where? How? So, so that's the thing. That's a mistake they make in classical control. When they teach students, they never tell them. <laughs> so, and that was one big point uh, Richard Murray made in his presentation. You know, how did this come from? What is Z desire? You know, and so basically, you have some intuition that you know. I, if somebody hits the accelerator, they want to get to a certain speed, but not too fast. And so you cook something up. But my next slide will answer the question. All right. So, so this is classical control. So obviously I'm going to go a little bit further. And then this, so next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, um, oh, wait, wait, wait. I mean, forget this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but I, I will say this. So again, I, I didn't say this. I left something out. I mean, again, it's all model based, you know, um, and you have a disturbance. So this is real wind hitting the airplane. You have noise that's not real. It's it's your sensors have noise, and also you model uncertainty in the process through another feedback loop, and you assume that these are all in some bounded class, you know. So that's that's so this. There's a robustness is a huge part of it. And you make sure that your solution is going to work regardless of, uh, you know, what um, of, of, of Delta N and D. And now I can, now, it's this slide. Now next slide. Um, yeah, let me copy and paste that. <laughs> Probably shouldn't do this because I have a lot to say. But. I forgot that I had a few things here. So this you remember this because it's really important. Um, so this is exactly what what Shaba was was sort of getting at, and I was trying to make is that so my my task is to drive from here across to the farmers market, and is this my feedback system, right? So as I decide to drive across town, I will create this desired signal, you know, I will create this thing. My Z desired will, hey, I'm going to get in my car, turn it on, drive around, avoid the demonstrations downtown, and then go around and do this and that. There's a whole, the whole task of coming up with Z desired is a planning process in advance, and, um, and which, is, which is often ignored. Well, it is always ignored in a, in a classical control course. Um, so this whole thing of just reacting, doing everything in real time, is just a small part of the puzzle. And it, there's this trajectory generation, which is creating something more general, like this, this X ref, which, which generates a Z ref. It's sort of the same concept. Um, Basically, based on on your desires, you're going to come up with some trajectories. That's often called feed forward. Um, and then you're going to have this reactive part as well, which is based on typically state feedback. There's an observer that gets more than the Z that I talked about before, but in an entire state. Um, and so you've got this incredible big uh, extra layer. And typically, every one of these yellow boxes is built around MPC, model predictive control, which is the same as re receding horizon control. And really, it's a misnomer to call this feed forward. 
because it's really what was happening is this, in this case, two time scales for control. There's the reactive thing where I'm driving, speed up, push down, turn the wheel. There's a feedback loop continuously like that. And there's a trajectory generation where there's also feedback. Because I plan to drive a void downtown, but then the road was shut down. I have to re-optimize. You're continuously updating this trajectory generation. So it's a, a slow time scale for control and a fast time scale. So there's what Richard Murray called reactive. The trajectory generation is just a slower time scale. All right. And so there you see a connection with MP with RL that's more clear, I think. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. What else do I want to say there? I think that I okay. So you can see that there's an RL connection, but let's not go there yet. Let's say a few more things. So adaptive control has exactly the same obsessions as as we do. You know, I I haven't worked in adaptive control since forever, um, but they want to do this. They want to solve this optimization problem, but maybe with only partial model information. And um, and the way it's defined. Um, in, in, for example, Max Rudzinski's chorus, which he's teaching this semester, this is his, the first page of his his lecture notes, um, which is quite which is quite fun. Um, the definition is almost exactly the same as RL. You know, I'd like to control a system, reach a goal without exact knowledge of the system. And that's a perfectly valid definition of RL. Um, and the thing is, an example would be a model, an MDP model, or a linear system of bounded dimension. But you assume those things for analysis. <laughs> Everyone knows that when you're done, you, the real world doesn't satisfy those assumptions. That's why we're obsessed with robustness, OK? So, um, so the, 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 root, the adaptive control and RL have really essentially identical goals, I would say. And again, I know that's fighting words to some of you, but that's my opinion, <laughs> OK? Um, I think that RL, you know, in, in real life, there'll be some partial knowledge, um, model knowledge which goes into the architecture, okay? Just like adaptive control. I think adaptive control is more model-based than RL, that's for sure. Um, and I, I'm not gonna go through every bit of this, except a common tool is this ODE method. Uh, that term was from Leonard Jung, but it's uh, the, the, the stochastic approximation method of Robinson Monroe, and so, two incredible heroes, Johnson Sickles and Michael Jordan, um, simultaneously in 1994, pointed out the connection between Watkins Q learning and stochastic approximation. And, um, you know, and, and, and stochastic approximation was a foundation of adaptive control forever. And, you know, I mean, forever. I can't give you the first uh, papers. But this is, a, this is an old paper from the 70s by Leonard Jung, and I'm going to come back to it. Because I think he went backwards. I think Leonard, I love him, but I think he made a mistake in this paper. Having equation one saying this is a standard algorithm, nah. <laughs> I'll get back to it. This is this is the, the punchline will come later. Okay. All right. So um, so there's common analytical roots as well as common goals. Okay. So boy, time flies when you're having fun. Um, I'm gonna I'm not gonna go through all of this. I'm gonna later on. You know, I'm going to talk about uh, Richard Sutton's wonderful um, uh, car problem, trying to get to the top of a car efficiently. And there's a value function. Basically, I'd like to look at the total cost until I reach my goal. Um, and, and by the way, there's a, an exercise for all of you. Why is this state position and velocity? Doesn't have to be. You know, the state is something we manufacture depending on our goals. That's true in, in classical control and in RL, but we'll take that. Um, and uh, this example is very swim, similar to swinging up a pendulum, for which is a lot of really cool tricks in the control community. So I recommend this uh, reference by Astrom. Um, and then there's a dynamic program equation. And hence, it, you know, as, as, as you all know, <laughs> okay. Um, and Q learning is all about estimating this beautiful thing. Okay, so I told you I'm not going to use pi. I'm not going to, you know, um, use rewards. But Q is sacred. You know, we all know that. I'm not going to get rid of that. We are Q. All right. 
<laughs> that, that's sacred. And because you know, one of the reasons we want to get Q is because we get the policy, but also because Monte Carlo methods work so beautifully to estimate Q. So there's two reasons for estimating Q. Um, and I'm not going to go through those. So if you want to, we've monkeyed around with some really dumb Q linear problems for a heating and ventilation system. I realize I don't have time to go through it. Um, but we just took the stupidest possible um, setup, taking a quadratic uh, a quadratic function of just arbitrary state variable. We just created a fake state with forecasts, um, <laughs> a forecast of, of future humidity, forecasts of occupancy, this junk, got a quadratic uh, um, approximation for the Q function, and, uh, and it worked. <laughs> It took a million uh, samples to make it work, but it, it worked. So it's it's amazing how you can hack away um, and and get things to work. I just I just love it. Um, so this is, but this is not for this audience. You guys have seen much more exciting examples. Um, I w I will mention though that this thing that we call ZapQ learning was the only thing that worked for this example. So there's a challenge for some of you. Um, okay, but so. Um, so again, um, I mean, so I'm not going to go through that. But uh, so, so we all know this uh, dynamic program equation, and you all, most of you, know how to go to to um, Q learning, and it's exactly what you know. You you look at this function, you make a definition, and you you the magic is notation almost. I have an operator that takes any function of two variables to a function of one variables by taking a minimum, and you can see from this dynamic program equation that the minimum of Q is just J. So you go from a fixed point equation for J to a fixed point equation for Q. And thank you, Watkins, you know, it's just, it's just absolutely awesome. And we get the minimum outside you know, here the minimum is, is, I mean, outside of, of, um, of F. You know, having this minimum outside of this uh, expression here makes it, using Monte Carlo methods very difficult. And Chris, I guess Chris Watkins, maybe Rich Sutton had something to do with it. The genius of, of introducing the Q function is right there. And as he pointed out, it all becomes, um, yeah, I mean, Q could see they could be anything. Um, it all becomes model, model free. You know, this just absolutely wonderful trick. And you couldn't do this with this representation up here. You know, you wouldn't be able to get this beautiful model free representation of error uh, without this trick of going from the Q function from the, from the value function j to the q function here, um, and that really is is the is the starting point of of q learning algorithms, um, and, and it's just wonderful. Um, and so, I'll just say a few more words on this. So, um, one thing one can do is look at this uh, again. I've got this model free representation of this Bellman error. And one thing you can do, I want to try to make it approximately zero on my observations. And you could look at the mean square. There's no problem with that. You know. And you can do There's gradient descent. Yeah. Yep. So there are some questions. Uh, so first okay. question, just clarifying, is everything deterministic here? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot to mention that. So I, I decided to give myself a challenge and make everything deterministic for the entire day. So I'm going to relate things to stochastic settings as well. But um, uh, but I'm going to try to argue with you, if I have time, that this makes sense even if it's stochastic. It won't solve the problem exactly. It'll solve a different problem. <laughs> but it's not a bad problem. It depends on how much volatility there is. Yeah, so yes, all deterministic. This whole entire thing it will be deterministic, but quasi. Sometimes I'll have quasi-randomness. Um, like sine waves, things like that, quasi-random quasi numbers. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you can get away with this here. Um, mm -hmm. 
it makes things so much easier to explain. So there it is. <laughs> so I could I could have like something you know RD where I have by a stable feedback law plus a, a mixture of sinusoids. Right. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Another question from Amin. Yeah. I think it's for some earlier slides. Uh, and it says the note that you mentioned about the reference, some call it active input, right? When Z uh, desired uh, at the next yeah. time step is F times Z desired, yeah. three times yeah. steps plus uh, G times uh, the input oh, at yeah. time, same time step. It's been a while ago, I think. Yeah, it's way back there. Um, no, no, I don't. I'm not sure it's worth it. We should. We should. Oh, yeah, go probably not. Okay. Uh, well, let's go back. We'll, we'll get back to it during the break. Okay. Um, because yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be re relevant to the rest. Right. Um, okay. But you know, you can do gradient descent. You know, and it works sometimes. I mean, I've done gradient descent on on silly examples, and it's been great. Um, and the, the my, my main point here is that you go through and you look at an ODE. So the entire the thing I'm going to be pushing is this ODE method. Every single lecture, I'm going to be talking about the ODE method. Where you first look at, I've got my F, which is my mean dynamics, uh, which is minus the gradient of my loss function. Um, and first I look at the ODE and say, is it stable? Is it doing what I want? And if yes, then I go through and I translate. And this is the definition of, of stochastic. Well, I'm going to be calling it QSA. The Q stands for quasi, the so quasi stochastic approximation, because everything's deterministic. All right. Um, and this works brilliantly sometimes, but it's a horribly non convex function. Awful. So it's not convex. So that's the trouble. Which is a big sad face. We'll fix it next hour. All right. Um, in the stochastic case, you can't do this to your question, anonymous attendee. Um, you can't exactly do that because you, if you want to solve the problem, if you want to respect the equations, you can't square it with Bellman error. So what people do um, is they do something that's called a, a Galerkin relaxation. Or projected Bellman error. Um, those are the those are the two names for it. You stick a a, a d-dimensional vector zk, where if theta is is, is uh, d-dimensional, and you try to find the roots of this function. Okay, that's that's really what Q learning and and TD linear uh, end up uh, trying to do. Uh, it's a relaxation of the constraint that you'd really like the conditional expectation of this guy to be zero uh, with probability one, all right? And um, this data k is called the eligibility vector. All right. Um, and uh, and, you, and we'd like to set that to zero. Um, the uh, design principles are the same. If you want to derive Q learning, you basically can look at an ODE and if you like, put in some matrix gain. And then you use an Euler scheme if you if you like, and you get an you know, approximate Euler scheme and do just as I did before. Um, you know, I, I mean I'll go back if you like. Ah, you do exactly the same thing. You know, you replace the mean object with the observed samples. You know, that's what it's all about. And so for Q learning, traditional Q learning, it's not a gradient, it's the eligibility vector comes in instead. Okay. So if, if you'd like, I'll write it down. You go theta n plus one equals theta n um, plus uh, uh, alpha n plus one again, times again if you want here, and then times this thing here, this uh, this zeta n times some um, dn, dn, I'll call it, plus one. This whole thing would be called dn plus one. The temporal difference. Does that look familiar? 
Yeah, it does. Yes. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> okay. So that's 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 it. So where do we go from here? I have a minute, right? I have thirty seconds. So this is this is my my sadness that I can't be in France right now. This would be after you get out of the metro on your way to Inria, Paris. You would you would see this this happy woman, and, and go around the corner and find your way to Inria, in Paris. But I, sadly, I'm stuck here in Florida. Um, so the aspects, the really big takeaways, every control problem is multi-objective in terms of things you care about and there's safety and robustness and blah, blah, blah. I think that we're always gonna have this hierarchical business. If we have multiple control loops in RL as well as in traditional control, um, it makes sense. You can look, do some micro controls to simplify this system on a macro level. That's the example. And uh, of course, use a model if you if you can, and uh, test, test, test. <laughs> um, you know, we all know that. That's I'm speaking to the choir. Um, so there's that, some other tricks of the trade. I didn't talk about control. They happen to functions. It's so close to RL, it's ridiculous. You know, and um, you know, Google it. <laughs> model reduction techniques are a huge part of uh, control, it's like a, a big part, and it's been a big part of my own research, fluid models, and this is all, this model reduction leads to methods for feature uh, selection. So I want a basis for approximate Q function, gain insight from a, a, a naive model to do so. And of course, mean field games are awesome as well. I won't get into that, this is just, this is advertising. Um, so in terms of the next lectures, just real quickly, this, this awful complex nonlinear Bellman equation, the, the lack of convexity I talked about has been a roadblock forever. The, the LP approach to uh, op, optimal control has been mentioned in previous talks. Um, that leads to Q-learning algorithms. I don't know why we don't use them. So that's the next lecture. Um, I want to try to convince all of you to always start with an ODE. So, no, Leonard, no. The, the equation one should be, a, here's an ODE with desirable properties. How do we design algorithms based on that? That should be, this is step one. You design Q. Oh, I'm sorry, use Q. <laughs> I, it's not my fault. Leonard used the Q there. Um, you design a really nice OD with really good properties and then translate it based on observations and based on your advice from your favorite numerical analyst. That's lecture two, I'm the, you know, the next lecture. Uh, and finally, gradient free optimization and, and policy gradient RL. And Shaba, I'm gonna give you the full history on active critic algorithms uh, in that lecture. And so step one, OD design. Step two, quasi-stochastic approximation, put in some sinusoids or something. And then finally you do your Euler Lagrange, I mean your Euler, Euler Lagrange, <laughs> or Runge-Kruta methods, and you get an algorithm you can put in a computer. That's what I want to sell today. All right, that's my sales pitch. All right. Um, and, uh, and so this, this QSA concept there, it's way more reliable, I think, than stochastic methods. When you have a control system that's not that uh, volatile, uh, there's lots of uh, theory to explain why it's the way to go. All right, um, so, and um, uh, that's it. Yep, and then of course there'll be a talk by Andre after that on, on uh, applications of similar ideas. Yeah, just just to play devil's advocate a little bit. Of course, cool, I cool. normally disagree with this, but. Uh, like it seems like an awful lot of trouble to uh, start with a continuous time thing and then go through all of these steps if at the end yeah. of the day everything happens in discrete time in the computer. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to sell this to you as we go along. It, it's definitely not the easy sell this to you because um yeah 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 I mean it's just that uh, yeah I'll give um yeah. Oh, I'll give examples. I'll give examples. <laughs> I'll give examples where you could never come up with it in a way unless you had an ODE. 
Yeah, you're right. In some cases, it would be absurd. You know, there's no way you would introduce CD learning first as an ODE. I mean, there's no way, it's a waste of time, you know. Um, and, um, but I think, but with Q-learning, I'm, I'm not sure. The ODE is so pretty. <laughs> you know, you can write down the ODE without all the, the notation is so simple, you know. Um, yeah, so I don't know. But you, I mean, are there exceptions? Everything I say has an exception. <laughs> it's not the only way to do things. Yeah. Um, but All right. uh, yeah, yeah. So do we do have uh, another question in Q and A? Um, I will just read it out. Is there a way to inc incorporate an approximate model? with Q learning or policy gradients in a way that makes up for the changes in spectra decomposition of the dynamic map and also non-stationary stochastic error in control. Oh my gosh, okay, Whoa, that's- Oh, wow, that's- <laughs> but, but I, I that's, didn't too much, that. that's too much to unpack. But, but, the, but I think that it's a, it, I, I, whenever I teach stochastic control, I always say that RL sells itself at being model free when I think it's the biggest deficit of RL. You know, that RL doesn't have the tools to use a model if it had one. I think that's a deficit, not a, not a benefit. I think it, there, are, there are cases where it's a benefit. I mean, there are cases where I believe so strongly in that point of view. Bandits, Chaba. In bandits, there's no way there's a model. It's online learning. The, 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 that point of view is so dead on correct. But in, in autonomous vehicles, where I have so much structure and model, uh, you know, model, uh, model um, properties, I'd love to be able to use that prior knowledge in the design of a reinforcement learning algorithm. And I think it's a significant gap in the field. Um, I think, again, I, my ignorance is vast. So there's a lot of things I could be missing. But I think that's an exciting challenge. So I guess uh, there are some simple ways that you can yeah. combine your learning and, and similar algorithms with model-based uh, learning, right? So Rich Sutton likes this Dyna architecture where you simultaneously learn a model, and then mm -hmm. the model also generates extra um, data that is fed into your model free algorithm. And yeah. so, yeah. right, like there are like some obvious ways of, of doing these yeah, things. Sure. Uh, uh, it's not like that people didn't try or it is. Oh, no. Oh, like no. That. Yeah, sure, sure. No, but I'm just saying, no, no, I'm saying it's still a frontier. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm not saying nobody thought yeah. of it. Um, it's it's not, yeah. not totally clear of like what's a good way or what's, yeah. Anyways, yeah, uh, yeah. Rene Carmona is asking, uh, why do you bring up mean field games? Oh, it's so, it's, so, it's, it's advertising, Ramon. Uh, uh, um, it was so much fun. So, so, so the control community is obsessed with reduced order models, and they they come up with like a like I mean mean field games. They come up with like a one dimensional model of an infinite of an infinite dimensional system, and they say, "My God, success!" and they walk away. <laughs> uh, and and basically, this this is from one paper where we basically took the pre limit. So is this so we, we got the solution from an infinite agent limit and we looked at 10 agents and we knew the structure of the optimal solution at infinity so we said well let's give each agent a q uh, a a uh, q learning problem and they're all going to solve a q learning problem pretending that they're at the infinite limit and it worked perfectly <laughs> it just was crazy you know every agent the parameters converge to exactly what the infinite limit should, should satisfy. Yeah. Um, so this is the way we got structure from a abstract model and just it just solved a I'm problem, trained. a toy pro a toy problem. But it was it gave the it gave the architecture for the Q yeah. function approximations. Um, and this was a multiplayer game, so there's no way there'll be theory to support it. I don't think. I, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, All right. but, but, but yeah, but the whole thing is model reduction. And that's all, that was my point in both of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any other questions uh, for now, and we are right on time. Uh, 
So this is uh, good. Oh, okay. Some other question arose. Hi, uh, Bora uh, Yonga Soglu. Uh, hi, Sean. Thanks for the talk. You used the word gain in a few slides during the, this talk. And I've seen it all over the place in Contra, but I don't have any background. And I don't know what gain is supposed to mean. Gain? Oh, no. On. Yeah. Oh, when did I use that? You mean way back? In the beginning? Yeah, yeah, like at the very beginning, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. control when you were talking oh, man. about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, wind so, up. Uh, what let's, let's like the wind yeah. up, the wind up, I can't get into. It's basically very often you're integrating observations. Um, and when you integrate something, it tends to explode, and people call that wind up. But uh, do I have a simpler thing? Where's my. Where's my simple feedback loop? Right here. So, so I've got I've got measurements, you know, and then I have some sort of signal here which leads to an error signal. Right here, and this compensator is often very simple. Simple. Uh, uh, an example of a com uh, of a um, there's a U here. An example of U is just to take E plus some constant. I'll call it K sub I times the integral from uh, well, e sub, u sub t. Um, and oh, I should put a k here as well. So k, p, and k, i are gains. So why do you integrate the error? You know, you want the error to go to zero. You know, so and so if you use if you use just this uh, proportional control law, oh, well, you're not going to kill the error. But if you integrate it, if that integrated go, remains bounded, you can. There's a lot of theory to say you've, you've solved your problem. The error goes to zero. But when these gains are large, <laughs> it's it's like driving a car on, on after too much coffee. <laughs> you know, just wham, wham, wham. And if you if you also have drunk too much, there's a delay. You're unstable. So um, well, that that's what when they, they talk about high high gain. What's that? That introduces the delay. A delay plus the high gain, you, you're unstable. That's right. That probably killed you. Uh, yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> okay, so next question. Uh, so that relates to the end of the talk, uh, jumping back and forth. Uh, do the convergence properties translate to the stochastic case? Uh, yes, yes, yes. The, uh, the theory of stochastic approximation is so complete, it's crazy. You know? And, and, and Vivek Borkhardt's going to have a new edition of his book out uh, next year. It's just there are so few assumptions needed to go from the ODE to the Sissi-Castor approximation. It's really something, you know. Um, so yes, mm -hmm. the answer is yes. Um, you need some uh, moment bounds, et cetera, things like that. So Alp uh, Kutlu Alp <laughs> is asking the question, could you talk about your earlier comment? on financial sector and RL, was wondering what your perspective of the RL experience in the financial sector was, if you could elaborate. Oh, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. OK, so I've met people from the finance area quite often. And there, there's, a, there's rumors going along in finance that people in RL came along and had no respect for learning about, you know, the issues in finance and this tried to sell the algorithms. And it was all. So this is just anecdotal, okay? But I, I, oh, let me say a couple of people, but 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 we're, we're firmly ingrained in the Morgan Stanley and other com and a consulting company, and and basically said that there wasn't any interest in really learning about the problems and issues, um, and I think that I've seen I've seen traces of that in papers, you know what is what's the proper features for Wall Street to solve a a problem in Wall Street? Think about how hard that would be. Imagine just looking at stock prices. <laughs> it's Trump's tweets might be more important than stock prices. Uh, it's a it's a damned hard problem, um, and uh, and you know and also there's a lot of history and hacks to uh, come up with uh, with tricks for uh, stock trading, and uh, and that th that might be inspiration for good architectures for Wall Street. But that was also Apparently ignored. You know, again, I I know very little about finance. So I don't. I'm not the expert. This is you know. 
But I think finance is a, is a cool area. I, I'm not going to get into it, but for some people, I think there's a, a lot of low hanging fruit. Um, okay. I don't see any more questions, so let's take a quick break and uh, we come back after the break. How, when are we back on? Is it just 10 minutes? Uh, no, I think that it's half an hour usually. Uh, half an hour, okay, cool. All right, good. Yeah, we come back at uh, in in 27 minutes. Okay, so one last question. What does Tita represent? Uh, like oh, on yeah, this slide? Yeah. Oh, this slide, it'll be anything. You know, so so okay. theta, you know, you could have U UK equals some parameterized policy. You know, that's a possibility. Or you could have your our friend Q theta of X U. Yeah. You know, those those are those are the two examples. You know? Right. Just <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. All right. See you soon. All right. Great. Right.